In this video, we will explain the reason for reactive programming, but why it is not popular with developers, and also why, with the introduction of Java Virtual Threads, it may be even less likely to be used. Imperative style programming has always been very popular with developers. The reason for this is very obvious. If then else, the while loops, functions, blocks make the resulting code easy to understand, easy to debug, and easy to imagine. Also, the exceptions resulting from the code are easy to track down. But with all good things, there usually is a problem. The problem in this case arises from the fact that this style of programming results in the thread being blocked for a much longer period of time than necessary. To understand this, let's take a look at a typical enterprise use case request where the code has to fetch data from a database fetch data from a web service and then merge the results into a final result and send back to the user. On the screen, you can see the thread of execution from top to down as a vertical arrow with green parts being the CPU portion of the execution and red parts being the time when the thread is waiting for data. Now in an application server like Tomcat, one platform thread is usually dedicated to the user request, and this thread will proceed to make a call to the fetch data from the database. That's the call to fetch data from DB, and then make a call to fetch data from a web service. That's the call to fetch data from service, and then proceed to merge and send the data to the user. That's the call to send data to user. Most enterprise applications are IO bound, and therefore, the thread is practically wasting resources blocking most of the time. The diagram on the screen simply shows the representation of the user request thread for the synchronous blocking design. Here we are assuming we are using the platform thread, the traditional Java thread. In Java, platform thread is an expensive resource because by default, each platform thread will consume one megabytes of stack memory. That means that there will be an upper limit to the number of platform threads running in a JVM at a time. So if one platform thread is dedicated to a user request, it presents a problem for applications with a high number of concurrent users. The traditional way to solve this problem is to create a thread pool with a maximum number of threads. In Tomcat, it's defaulted to 200. And then the architects can scale the applications horizontally or vertically as needed to support a large number of users. Scaling vertically would mean to add more resources to our containers or VMs. Scaling horizontally would mean to add more instances of the applications and front the application using a load balancer. Now that's all typical. To improve performance, we could use an asynchronous model where we parallelize some other tasks which are running serially. For example, if we assume that the fetch tasks for both database and web service can run in parallel, then they can be executed in separate platform threads of their own. In such a case, the thread diagram would look like on the screen. Now in this scenario, the user request thread initiates two threads, two platform threads, one to fetch data from database and the other to fetch the data from the web service. It will then block to get the results from both and then proceed to merge and send the data to the user. In Java, this can be achieved by submitting a callable or runnable tasks to an executor service and by using Java futures. Now, all this will improve the performance since the two data fetches are now being performed in parallel. However, even though there might be a performance improvement most of the time, the number of platform threads now increases from one to three for a short duration of time. From a scalability perspective, this would make things worse during that period. Now we already provided one solution for this, scaling our applications horizontally and vertically. What's the problem with this? It's way too expensive. Now, is there another solution to this? Yes. The reactive style of programming was born to solve this problem. The problem being that the expensive platform threads are wasting most of its time doing nothing during a blocking operation. With the release of Servlet 3.0 and Servlet 
the HTTP servlet thread does not need to be alive to send the HTTP response back to the user. And this opened the door for some clever programming to avoid thread blocking. Java 8 introduced the completable future class where we can create reactive pipeline. What's the big idea here? The big idea of reactive style of development is to specify a pipeline for execution for a use case and not execute the use case itself. The execution of the pipeline would happen independently and in other threads. As an example, the user request thread would just specify the reactive pipeline for the use case and will be released back to the pool as quickly as possible. That's what it is doing in the diagram. This pipeline could be a completable future pipeline or a spring web flux pipeline, does not matter. The diagram on the screen shows this design. In this scenario, the user request thread creates a pipeline for the three activities to run fetch data from service and fetch data from DB in parallel and then send data to user after both the fetches are done. But after creating this pipeline, the user request thread will simply be released back to the thread pool. This greatly reduces the burden on the JVM because now it has one less thread per user to deal with. Once the data fetching threads complete execution, the data will be sent to the user. That would be all part of the pipeline execution phase. But notice that this only partially solves the problem. Why? Because you can see that the actual activities of fetching data from the web service and database are still blocking in their respective platform threads. This brings up an important point. The developer must make sure that the tasks that he is submitting from the pipeline are not blocking. This is hard to get right because it is done manually and is definitely error prone because it will not be flagged as a warning during compile time or runtime. And also, in many cases, as time passes by and as developers make changes, we can easily introduce bugs in the system. Now, how do we improve this design? To make this design completely reactive, the fetching of the data from both the database and the web service must be done in a non-blocking way as well. In Java, the introduction of NIO, that is the new IO, as part of the JDK 7, opened the door to non-blocking IO. All classes and methods in Java which are IO-based now have a non-blocking version. Examples being socket read writes, file read writes, locking APIs. As developers, we would have to use these non-blocking versions of the classes and methods or a library which supports NIO to make these fetch calls to the data. The diagram on the screen shows such a design. You can see that within each of the fetch data, the thread which makes the data request and the thread which handles the data are different. This is done using the non-blocking APIs. For example, an HTTP GET request to retrieve data from a web service would be on a different thread than the thread which eventually handles the retrieved data. Now this is fully reactive and it solves the problem it sets out to solve. You can see the only time when the platform threads are used here are during the CPU operations and not during the IO. We see no red parts as part of the platform thread executions. This is fantastic. Now using this style of development, we are now able to achieve high scalability of our applications. However, the solution is way too complex. Creating reactive pipelines, debugging them, as well as imagining their execution in our head is difficult. Not to mention what happens when exceptions are raised. Not surprisingly, this style of development has not become very popular. Spring Boot has an entire non-blocking development stack dedicated to reactive style programming called Spring WebFlux, which uses Project Reactor under the hood. It supports many libraries which provide non-blocking behavior for databases, for web services, etc. So if this is complex, can we solve the scalability problem in a different way? Fortunately, yes. With the release of Java 21, 
Oracle introduced the much awaited virtual threads feature. As we already discussed, the problem with platform threads is that during the blocking operation, it effectively becomes useless. The platform thread is basically a thin wrapper around the operating system thread. And as we know, operating system threads are expensive. Virtual threads on the other hand is an implementation of thread class in the JVM and is lightweight. Finally, it boils down to this. When virtual thread is used for code execution, it will use a platform thread during the CPU operations. That's called carrier thread and will release this carrier thread when it encounters an IO operation. How does the JVM know when it encounters an IO operation? As I mentioned before, most IO operations in the core Java libraries now have a blocking and a non-blocking version. When running in a virtual thread, the JVM will automatically switch to using the non-blocking version of the IO operation. This change has been made throughout the core Java libraries for most IO operations. When code encounters an IO operation, the carrier thread is released back to the pool and when the data from that IO is available, the virtual thread will be rescheduled on another carrier thread to handle that data. In other words, blocking in virtual threads is not a problem at all because the underlying carrier thread is released. Now in an application server, developers now have an option of using a virtual thread for the user request. The result of this is that the developers can use the same imperative style development as before and yet achieve the scalability benefits that they get when using the reactive pipeline without the unnecessary complexity. The diagram on the screen shows the synchronous blocking design, but this time using virtual threads. If you look at the diagram, the user request thread is a virtual thread, blue vertical arrow, but the red portion on the thread is no longer an issue. That's because during the blocking operation, the underlying carrier thread will be released and does this achieves the same scalability benefits as using reactive framework. The next diagram shows the use of virtual threads in an asynchronous blocking design. Earlier in the article, we mentioned that we could use Java futures for this, and we most certainly have the option of doing that. However, Java 21 has introduced a new set of classes called structured task scope and subtask to deal with structured asynchronous behavior. Currently, these classes are in preview mode, but it's worth playing with it. Finally, it boils down to this. The combination of virtual threads and structured concurrency will be extremely powerful in the future. Virtual thread makes blocking a non-issue and structured concurrency will give us higher level classes to deal with asynchronous programming in an intuitive manner. It's very difficult to see why somebody would be using completable future from now on. There are a lot of advantages of using virtual threads as opposed to reactive frameworks. Here are some of them. We can continue to use imperative style development. No need to create complex reactive pipelines. No need to use non-blocking IO directly in our code. And finally, it's easier to code, easier to debug, and easier to wrap our heads around the design. Now that's just fantastic.